sure appreciate y'all coming out tonight. There's some more in there in the uh, uh, lunchroom yet. We'll get this underway pretty quick. What this is, is uh, the Missouri uh, University of Missouri, Missouri Extension Service in conjunction with Kirksville Livestock. Putting on a little program tonight. Uh, we're going to show you some, this is Zach Irwin down here. He's got, most of you know him. He's got some cattle we're going to send to the feedlot. They are going to load out tonight at 9 o'clock, headed for the feedlot. Now what we're going to do tonight, we're going to show some different drafts, different frame scores, different body types on. Roger Parker, a uh, well-known legendary cattle guy. <laughs> I won't embellish it too much. But Roger's been in the industry for years and years, decades and decades. He's, uh, you, some of you probably remember him as a USDA market reporter for various livestock auctions around and still does, he does some fill in for that. He's uh, been a fat cattle purchaser. He's been in the cattle business, I guess I said, for many years. He will have some interesting insights and information that will help you help us uh, all have a better understanding of what, what we kind of should be targeting, what we need to be looking for as we head into uh, marketing our livestock. Uh, within the industry, of course, it's shifting and changing every day, and it's very important to understand what kind of market we need to be targeting, have some kind of strategy for that, make sure our product is what they are, is in demand by the buyers. There are fewer buyers, there are fewer producers, everyone's keeping closer track of what they're doing, so it's very important to get a health program in them. Uh, Build your reputation with your cattle, with your handling, and your kind, and your type. And now, as, as you kind of watch what goes through here, you'll get a better, or maybe we'll get an idea of some of uh, what they're looking for in body type, or I guess what the uh, certain frame scores and how they will perform in the feedlot, and what the buyers will be looking for when they get to them. So Zach will come in. I don't know if he has anything to say or not, Roger. He likes to compete with me. He usually has a lot to say, so we're going to be fighting for the microphone today. Yeah. No, no. So, uh, and you know, we'll try to get as much information, and then we'll have, you know, if somebody has any questions about why this is like this or why it's like that, but be sure and fire in because, like I said, we want everybody to get a, a good understanding of what what the, the livestock industry is looking for, what they're doing, what, what cattle will perform, how they will perform, and uh, it goes along with that as far as in conjunction with your health program. Going forward, we hope to maybe in, in conjunction with the University of Missouri Extension, probably we'll have some more programs going through the summer concerning grazing and uh, what kind of cattle will perform on that and uh, what grasses will do good in this part of the country and the cattle, how they will do on well them. But tonight, yeah, I'm sitting there in the dark. But anyway, we're going to run these cattle in. I guess we'll, I've got to fire this up so we can all see kind of what we're doing here. But uh, like I said, we'll start in, get some cattle in. Roger, you have anything to say, Roger? Said, I, you know, this is going to be fairly loosely run, so if you've got questions of anything these guys say, I'm not going to sit up here and blah, blah, blah all night long. Um, just just a little bit of background. Um, I think this is probably the fourth or fifth year I've been sending cattle up to the feedlot. Um, 
I'm just going to be right. We, we talked about a profitability prospect. That's about zero um, at the moment, as it looks. <laughs> I got some out there now, Roger, that uh, they're getting real close to getting done, and dollar forty-eight looks really good. And now it's thirty-eight. Now it's thirty-eight. Yeah, the market sure is a Change pretty fast. Changes in a heartbeat. So that's six dollars lower than it was three weeks ago. But that, I, I think anything in the cattle market is driven off of the fed cattle market. I mean, your feeders, your calves, even your cows and calves. What? You're gonna take a blood that way. Supposed to be promoting like you. Yeah, I'm probably taking blood. Well, that's if you got heads. If you got heads, then you may not. I don't. I, I missed pulling the trigger when they were 146. I thought they were headed to 150. Right. You named about five other guys. I remember when my granddad said, get close to what you want, you better check it, boy. You may not get back there. Here, wait a minute. Let me write that down. Let me write that down. If you get close, you get close to that 150, you better take it. Okay, we're just going to have to tell everybody what they want. Uh, so you can tell if this is way there, you can. So we got these things sorted up into five lots. We got them, got them broken down similar to how they would sell in a sale. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Roger talk here in a minute, and he's going to grade them for us. So frame, muscle, flesh, he's going to talk about what that means how that projects forward. And then I'm gonna let both of these guys up here talk about what they like and what they don't like about the cattle. Now, Roger, you're not gonna hurt my feelings, but if you don't, if you, there's some things you don't like about it, you just gotta say it. And, but explain why you don't like it too. So. I've judged a lot of fat cattle show four acres in the county fair So this will be. I've always wanted to sell that first eight dollar bill now two, now three. So this this will be your big drive of steers. I mean this is this is kind of the, the front end and they are weighing seven ninety one. I saw a biker in a pen, I saw a trucker, I said, Some of them big kids in there look like me, they're weighing eight of a They said the whole group had seven ninety one. So as you look at them, you can See, going by the color of their skin, the ones that are black hided, you presume maybe they're out of Angus Bull. But it may not. It may be out of well, it could, but it could be out of Chemical Bull, or usually they put a blade face on the truck. But all the cross bridge, the yellow, the yellow meadows and the white ones, you know they're out of Charlotte Bull. The reds probably out of Red Angus. I agree with me? Does that look like to you what they look right in here? How many heads do they say they look? 18. 18. All right. 18 head weight average weight 791. They're all steers. Uh, came last year, February, March. Uh, uh, so this year. They're just right out a year old. Some of them maybe not quite. The black ones I know, some of those are not quite a year old. But they're, they're burned now. Just for a little bit of background, as far as vaccination program, that I don't send, I try not to send anything out to feedlot that doesn't have at least two full rounds of modified live. One of those being your old pasturella, what they call homophilus now, and uh, a round of killed vaccine. Uh, there's been some research in the last few years that killed gives a little different type of response than the modified live. Now, anything that's a home raised in this deal will have at least three rounds of modified live and a round of kill because I give them a round of modified live when I kick them out in the spring. I'll give them two when I wean them and then usually a round when I uh, do a deworming or a, a delousing usually program. And I did that about five weeks ago. So that's kind of how the cattle have been handled health-wise. They've been on commodity feed, a mixture of corn, corn gluten, and recently DDT. Started on a little bit better starter ration than that. They'd had a, a, a mixture of 
grass and alfalfa hay. Some of them just straight grass, some of them not very good grass, and then some of them pretty good second, third cut and alfalfa hay. So that's kind of been the, that's what that has kind of been the nutrition and health program that these cattle have been on. Okay, you can see, I got two, four, six black hided calves in there, and the rest of them are crossbred. My opinion is that's a fancy, fancy set of calves, mostly crossbred and blunts, and they're averaging the 18 head, 791 pounds. And they're going to the feedlot, they're going to start them, and in this kind of flesh condition, when you see the hair on them, these cattle are kind of thin. They would sell real good any place you sell them. The crossbred cattle are a little thinner in the flesh than the black cattle. They must come from different slots. But they're just cause the black cattle, just the fence flesher, and look a little smaller to you than the exotics, they're really not small frame blacks. That'd be in the middle, the up end of the medium frame. And time they go through a growing process, that and I don't I think they got potential to go up to thirteen hundred pounds, the black cattle. And that's right in on a, like Melba Road, large frame by the USDA. Your exotics, Charlie Crosses and some of the Red Angus, which is taller, stand up taller, a little longer, a little stand up taller. They're, in my opinion, they're going to go to 1,400 pounds plus for their fat out in Kansas. We sent Kansas. Yeah. But they will grow. And that's why you send them out there to birth. And feed lots are in a business to sell you feed. He just wants them to be able to put it on at a cheap ration so it don't break them back. Now, Roger, uh, I'll speak to, will these all finish at the same time? No, the black cattle, now they're all in the same pen. And, and the way they sell cattle out west, they don't pen sore. You got a hundred in a pen, and they schedule them going in there, and they've been feeding, they get to be about 120, 125 days, they put them on what's called the show list. And they got two or three buyers. One comes around for Tyson, one comes around for Cargill, one comes around for JBS. And they suppose they're supposed to take turns looking at the cattle for a different lot. But anyway, uh, they say, well, what do you want to give me this group of cattle right here? Pen 805 or 120 head. And computer says they've been there so many days, they gained a little over four, two a day, they should be weighing right at 1,400 pound average. And they sell them kind of like bananas out there. Dollar 38, take it or leave. Back here, where I go look at farmer fed cattle, like I sell fat cattle. I work for a producer livestock out of Omaha, Nebraska. I had the last five years. I retired after 45 years with USDA. And I love fat cattle. And he's one of my customers, and he had 100 head in a group there. Look at him. I'd say, well, when black cattle are fatter, we probably need to sort them all. A few of them, not small, but smaller. Then the big tall guy, you know, the rednecks go on and we'll probably all sell them. And I think I can get you a dollar forty for them to go on the car grill up at Skyler and Rack. And then it'd be up to him to decide if he wants to take that or not. Now speak to uh, uh, feed conversion. Uh, in the frame score condition they are, body, con body condition that they're in. What's going to be the rate of gain on the greener ones, the uh, crossbreds, continentals, exotics, as opposed to the likes of the more flesh on? Well, the thinner cattle going to grain, are going to gain more on a hot ration than the the, the black cattle has got just a little more meat on. For conversion, the black cattle, you know, maybe well, they are they probably. 100 pounds lighter, 150 pounds lighter than what the group had. The group had 790 with it, that black cat full of airwall whales, 790 pounds. This one right here won't hit probably, probably 150 pounds to 200 the outside line. But they could be efficient at a certain weight, 
that go on a 14 iron pound. They can be fat weight for over half. It's be efficient or convert feed is the exotic. But the exotic gonna sell good if there's a group of them. Let me explain this to you. And I've watched this for years. The bigger the group of cattle, of one owner cattle, grain more than the ones and twos in the small package. That's just a fact of life. So if you've only got 10 cows and you sell twice a year, don't be getting on truckers' butt here. Don't be getting on me. Don't be getting on, I sold two calves, the best two calves in walk, and you quoted 500 pound calves top at $2, and mine bought $1.85. Wonder why that is. You had two heads, that's why you got it. The bigger the draft, you need drafts of like one order cattle look like anywhere from small as I'd say 10 here in Missouri. It's about a 20, 40, 60, 80 to a pot load. And they'll sell, present them in front of the buyers, and they're bringing all their worth that day. If you got right out of half a load or a low block. Now, but these cattle, you just gotta, they go to the yards. Uh, we can see the black cattle carry more flesh, a little different condition. And then when they, like I said, the bid will come in on the entire pen of cattle. The color cattle will be bigger, they will be heavier. Yeah. But will their feed conversion, will, will, will their carcass sweat the black cattle? Well, they're gonna be bigger. Great yield, great yield, with a great yield with them. I know they're gonna be bigger, but the carcass, well, when yeah. that comes out, how will that great yield with the black? Well, you're gonna have to hang on to them longer, be a little longer, and therefore they're gonna be bigger. And right now, just about all the packers I deal with, if you sell on a grid, they go like from 600 to 1,050 pound carcass. But just do the simple math, if you, if you don't want to dress 63%, just do 60, and then you can do simple math. But 1,050 pound carcass, that's calf weighing about 1,600 pounds. 16, 16 and quarter, if I'm doing 63, yielding 63, 63 and a half. If they weigh a thousand fifty-one pound carcass, they want to dock you fifteen cents a pound. That's not for that one pound, that's for all of them. A thousand and fifty-one pounds. So they can add up. He said he'd been down there, but some down one of them big old steers could be almost a three hundred dollar bill discount because he's eleven hundred pound carcass. But that they got those boxes set up. And they're not gonna change those boxes to put their meat in. You gotta fit the, the primals fit in those boxes so they put on that truck to send them down the road. So they put about 80 pounds to their box. And they don't want to, if it's a foot longer, they can't stop with them that box. So you gotta produce kind of the window that they want and they're not gonna change. They have it for 25 years. We go into this box feed program, that's where they all price them, all the packers. They sell the price to loin, to rib, the chucks, and all that. And so you just have to raise what they want. One thing I didn't tell you about muscle score. Anybody, you, you familiar with USD muscle score? There's one, two, and three. Well, if you got a three, you shouldn't be in the cattle business, in my opinion. That's a pretty sorry animal. That's not like a jersey or something like that. Most of these cattle would be the muscle score. Think of it in, think of it in the percentages, like a one, 100, that'd be like a, and I hope I don't influence anybody, but that, that's about like a limousine, and Jemima butt, got a brown butt like that. Them real heavy muscle cattle, there's a lot of red meat in there, but they don't, it's kind of hard for them to grade choice. I've been judging steer shows for going on 50 years, and I'm telling you, them real heavy muscle cattle, it's almost impossible. I mean, you even if you feed them a truckload of corn, it just Mother Nature will not let them grade. So muscle scores and all these right, all right here, they're all be like from a one, let me find, there was a one real thick one here. I think this, this yellow, I saw him back there. This one, you can't see him right here. But he like being filled with one, like a, about a 120, a 20% 20 up in one, one, just, there's a lot, a lot of the cattle that we sell to sale barns, they're high twos, like 
260s, 270s, 280s. As you go up like 290s, 290s up to like a 10. That's getting close to number one muscle. They're not all number ones. But these inheritors, he's got a pretty good set of calves, in my opinion. Bought or raised, whoever, whoever raised them. They're, they're eye peeling. They all got good natural thickness. They're all, most of them, they all look like me the ones. I have seen a, that, that he would be kind of like a low one right there, but he stands there. It could be pulled down on account of his flesh condition. But most of the black cattle got a little more meat on them. Sometimes with the meat on the calf, you kind of have to look through some of that. But sometimes that really not that natural thickness there. It's, it's covered, you know. Now by meat, you're saying flesh. Flesh, flesh yeah. Meat, and when I say meat, I meant flesh, yeah. But they're, they're pretty fancy set of calves, Chuck, in my opinion. And I, you know, I mean, they would, if you're cellborn, you'd have to sort the blacks off and then sell the color. Well, I'm glad to hear you say that because uh, several of these colored cattle came from the Ambrosia farm. So well, glad to hear you say that. You know me. I call it no, that's, I appreciate that. But now these cattle weigh in right at a, uh, a, a drink and they'll weigh a, yeah. and with the variation in the uh, Angus and in the in the colors with feed conversion, they'll still, you think they'll still come in carcass, even on the big cattle, their carcass come in under that 1050. Yeah. If, it, if, if they're pushed hard. If they're being right, but some of them are one big old yellow calf here and we're just white calf, right? Or he's a man right here. Oh, here's a horse. Here, he, he's going to yeah. get big. Yeah, them four riders are going to get big. And that one like the other. Yeah, them, them three right there together. They, uh, they feed them 125, 30 days. They could be bumping 16 hundred pounds, in my opinion. That's especially that one right there. He's a, that's a good muscle cat there. He'd be about 150. He, he's heavy muscle, and he's not fat either. Any question? I'll okay. say a couple things. So, Cattle are going to the extreme southwestern Kansas. It's, it's probably the best place in the world to feed cattle. Low humidity, sand hills, low sand hills, and not not much precipitation. The reason I go there is because I know the feedlot managers, and, and and Roger was talking about sorting these things. Okay, that they're going to sell the pin. These will not sell the whole pin. All these cattle you see tonight, they will at least have two different sale dates on them, if not three. There's, there's, that's the reason I go to that feedlot is because he's sort. Well, he's a smart man, in my opinion. You need, you need more guys like that. He is a smart man, and, and, yeah. and, and I've known that guy for a long time. And so he, he will go in there when, when he's got enough ready, and he might have to throw some on another truck somewhere else. <clears throat> but they'll go to the plant when they, they'll stop grading yields when they're done. You don't like you. You don't believe in selling lies. You want you want a gamble all the way. Both movies on that show the next I'm a gambler. That's good. I tell I've got some old timers that uh, send them back that I've known all my life. Only way they sold cattle was lies. Period. I mean, this one old timer, he's in his age, eighty five or six, and I was talking to him. And he said. Good cattle, they're going to trade good. I, mean, I sell them for you, sell them live, and I find out how to grade, and you're leaving money on the table. And he didn't understand what I was saying. I said, You should have sold them on a grade deal because you had like out of, out of uh, 38 cattle, you're going to have like about five or six prime. That's plus 15 to 25 dollars over the, the meat market. CABs would be five to six dollars. And it wasn't like about uh, fifteen dollars back on slats, and you're not going to have but one or two. And so I talked him into doing it. And one time, he picked up over fifteen hundred dollars. I told him, I said, "But well, just give that to me in my commission, because you didn't. Otherwise, you're going to sell them live. You didn't need that other fifteen hundred. He said, "No, I need it." I said, "So now I've had him now for five years. Home raised cattle is a good feeder." That's how we sell them now. So before we move on to the next group, I need you guys to price these. That, that first group weighs seven ninety one. Everybody saw. What are they going? What are they worth today? Seven ninety one. Buck 
Slaughter, what's perfect grade yield in them? What's the market? What's the market weight calling for now? Is it 1200, 1400? It's got to fit the box. So, what, what is the typical average weight for the box? Well, what works best for the box beef is a, what they tell me between a 750 and 850 pound carcass. But if you've been paying attention from USDA, we're up. The steer carcasses average like 924, and the heifers would be at least 50 to 60 pounds back. So they're they're not as big as the steers, and if you can't hang on to them too long, because you get them gobby too fast. And they don't they don't like yield grade five cattle. They're taking a few fours at the prime, but they'd rather have a yield grade twos and threes. And you. Can, all these exotics looking, I call them exotic, but all, I'm gonna say all colored cattle, they're gonna be tip, right on typical yield grade that they want. The carbon weight may be a little big, some of the steers. The heifers probably won't. Your live weight will be like 14 to 15 and a half or something, yeah. usually what comes right. out. Live weight all when they take them out, 14 to 15, that's where they like to get. And if you can get over that, like you said, that gets out of that box feed parameter. And then they don't like that. Anything less than that kind of well, it doesn't fill the box up. So they kind of like that general, as a rule of thumb, 14 to 15 and a half. These cattle are 17 head of these, they weigh 724. Uh, as you can see, they're just a uh, part of it has to do they're a little bit younger cattle, yeah. but they're a little bit different frame type on these cattle. They're a little more com compact, a little more, but, but carry their meat well on. All right, this, this one right here, you see it. You can tell. I talk about meat, flesh, he's come around by it. He's probably got the most flesh in this group here that I see. And uh, so you sell, you sell cattle by the pound. You don't sell them by the head, unless they're cattle. So as a group of them in a the ring, like that was real over there. And, and there'd be some buyers there, what I talked to you, $20 and 100 over these thinner like this yellow, yellow steer right here. Or that red, this red baldy steer right here. He's, he's in the right, he's in a real good flesh condition right here. Can you see him past his yellow steer there? there walking he's moving around, he's moving, right, right, he's moving right there. That's an, that's an ideal flesh right there, the buyer one. Well, same way this yellow one beside him, you know. They're, they're in the right flesh right there. I've got some guys that wanna buy cattle for grass when 575 to 675. And this is kind of the weight that they like. I got one guy, he wants all black hide cattle. Another guy takes some color cattle, but he doesn't want over 30%. So when you, when you go to buy cattle, you gotta use what the teachers taught you in second grade. You gotta use your fat, 30%. He might, he might lose the order if you put 40% on. But as you'll see on these, they're, they're 70 pounds lighter. And like I said, they're more compact frame, uh, younger kind of cattle. Now you hit those with that hot ration, there's a less chance that you're gonna correct me on this, less chance that you'll go bypass that 1050 carcass on that. You hit these with the right ration, these are gonna fall within there just is. their perfect parameters, won't they? Right, uh, the big, the big exotics make it up to maybe a thousand pound carcass, but I don't, this group rider, I don't think they will. They're probably spin out. Upper nine, 975 or 80 carcass. So frame score, frame okay. Okay. All right. grade, grade them for me as a group. Well, they'd be, uh, you got two, four, six, eight blacks, seven blacks. That'd be, uh, I'd say N70 to L80. So I'm saying they're going to be the black going to be fat about 12, 12 and a quarter, and their crossbreds are going to be fat 125, 130 pound 
bigger, 1350, 1375. Okay. And for muscle, uh, I, I haven't seen two yet. You got all good cattle like that up here in Kirksville. I mean, you all have farm or where you sell these things. Yeah, no, they're they're all, they're all being the ones that that's the really standard, but that'd be a low one there. He's thicker made like that that white faced Charlie right there. He'd be middle road one. He'd be like like a one twenty percent. He'd ever be like a one ten, but he's thin. There's this where's that fleshy black? At? There he is, right over there. You know, he looks pretty wide looking down his back, but it, most of that's flat. Same way going down his front. But he'd still be a one. He'd be a little one. Even that amount of flesh right now, that's called a one. No, I didn't. And will the color cow gray with black at the end of the day? Probably not. It's probably it's probably has to be fed. Well, two or three weeks longer, right? The black well, they'll be have to be fed longer. Yeah. But when they come yeah. carcass, will their carcass will they graze they, with the black? They look like to me. They got enough. They got enough muscling expression to them that they win. Them, uh, them lighter, or gotta watch how I say this. The planter crossbred cattle that uh, got a little bit ear influenced into them, either Santa Catrudis or Promas or Bravers or something, they're lighter muscle. And they're genetic wise, they're not known to marble real good. About like those heavy, real extreme heavy muscle. I call them windy, but them brown butted cattle. So, so would you call these a medium flesh? Uh, would they get that flesh? flesh? No, no, outside just one or two. Most of them just medium flesh. Yeah. I, they, they come in the group, and I have a smart reporter here. I would plug it in my computer. They'd be uh, medium plus and large ones. Number one, flesh, would be medium flesh. I mean, I, I don't look that one. You know, where he is right over I keep looking. But he, he's the only one's flesh. You take him all and chuck my face. Come Monday, if he's in the cellar, and run in here, some old boy from Iowa, he may want to take him all. He's he hold Iowa. that one. If he's from Iowa, he wants him fleshier than these. Yeah, yeah. I know, like, from Kansas. He wants him all. Okay, that's he wants from Kansas. Now, hold that one. So rather than the fleshy one, is there any other one that would make them? I wouldn't. I mean, you got to. Yeah, color I mean, I obviously yeah. Color. yeah, I wouldn't. The, and the, the condition on these cattle are, are is ideal for yeah. this weight class to sell right here as well. This, this is the kind of cattle that the guys like to buy. They like to show that they've had the ability to gain and eat a little bit. They're not too green and they're not too fleshy. They like the you know we all talk about green flesh and like to buy them as green as possible, but they also don't want them just thin. Right. And at this weight and all. Uh, this age, you kind of like to have that flesh because these, these guys are going to go get warmed up pretty much. So they kind of need a little bit of a jump to go ahead and do that. In my opinion, you can sell cattle too thin. And some buyers will not bet on them because they think they're sick. Yes, ma'am. How much do these flesh, did you say? 724. 724. Put a value on them. You better come Monday and buy them. If you can buy them selling things with the colors on them, you well, get right here. The market's got cheap for something. You know. Yeah, but I, I mean, dollar seventy is. If I can sell those colors on there at dollar seventy, wait, seven twenty-four. If you sort the colors off, the black cattle's on. They're gonna be lighter. They're gonna bring a dollar, maybe sixty-five. The color cattle depends on what they weigh, but they're gonna be they're gonna be heavier. They wouldn't bring a dollar cent anywhere else. I'd have money to do this week. Right. Next week's a different week. I, one place I saw the market was ten to twenty dollars lower. The next day I saw they were going three to five dollars lower. So it depends. Of course, now when you when you put on on this about the whenever we look at these market reports, and if you give everybody that gets in their phone and they look and see what this auction, what happened at Callaway last sale, what happened this time, and I saw Callaway they called ten to fifteen lower in some instances. 
a lot of these markets have been lower but uh, when we look at that we don't we got to watch and avoid panicking over that because if you think back to last week or two weeks ago there was a spike in the market so that thing is trended quite a bit higher so if we lose a little value it's not like the end of the world is coming. We're just kind of getting back to where we were. Maybe, you know, it's not as good as it was, but we're back to two or three weeks ago. It, it's not, what the price they're comparing to is not a constant. A week ago, Monday in here, this thing was white hot. It was, it was too hot. Uh, I mean, it wasn't, I've had guys ask about, oh well, boy, why they sell up there? And I said, don't take that for granted. That is not the market. So you sometimes, you know, coming next Monday, I sure hope it's as good as it was last Monday. Chances are, with circumstances and all, and then with being hot, it's gonna come in lower, but it's only, it's not gonna be maybe as much lower as you would think if you saw the figures, because that one was just, it was too good. said it's right and, and, and another thing it depends on how you hit the future market here about two months ago these eight weight yearlings just about everywhere they bring in the 60s and 70s everywhere but, but that was going to come when we had the futures paper futures up to dollar 48 well you know what it is today don't you i'm talking about april of 20 2022. They're not 30, 48. They're like about 36 or 7. So. And what he said, uh, I'll address that a little bit. About what he said about uh, everybody wants to buy groups. It, it, it's changed dramatically, even in the last five, 10 years, as far as uh, what everybody wants to buy. As I said earlier, we're selling to larger entities all the time. We don't have near as many farmer backgrounders as we used to. So these things are going to you. The, the alphabet soup, they're going to RK uh, lots, they're going to R lazy K lots. Uh, uh, of course, this is we have a lot of small producers in this area. They put us on the map when this thing was doing nothing, so I got a soft spot for them. So I have a uh, we have to have an arm to arm wrestle with these buyers because all they say is, well, my guys want to buy groups, they want to buy groups. And I would argue that you can get the value and get just as good cattle in these small packages. But that's just what they're getting the orders from, from above. They like to buy groups. They like to buy them all with the more uniform health programs and uniform genetics in them. I don't agree with it, but that's the way it is right now. So again, you know, when you start selling smaller packages and we see in the, in the, when you look at your phone and this weight class brought this or this weight class bought, brought that and mine didn't, a lot of it has to do with just the, the size of the group. And like I said, I don't like it but I'm not winning the battle. That's the way, that's the only way you get away from this small group is to put more headaches on sale barn owners. You'd have to have a cold manual sale of light cattle. They gotta be handled about the same, been weaned about the same many days, same kind of shocks, and then you can bring them in a gooseneck load and sort them up and sell them in groups of 30 to 60. But somebody's got to do the math afterwards because they got to sell on, they, they won't want to buy them on anyway. They got to sell on outlet. So you got to do the math both ways. And even now, though, there are some graded sales around. What he's talking about is a graded sale where you bring in smaller producers, put them all together. But, but even then, when you get grooves, uh, they're still going to have a different genetic package behind them. They're still going to have different age uh, group behind them. So even though you've got bigger numbers, that does not, in these graded sales, bigger numbers and drafts, that does not necessarily translate into competitive prices for larger groups of home raised or larger groups of purchased cattle from a guy that they know, a reputation producer. These cattle are three head in, they weigh 667 pounds, steers. Same thing, just like the other ones. Uh, Zach had these out at the farm, Anthony and I went out, we helped sort, we got some lighter ones uh, he kept at home. 
it's just an age deal on these cows. That's why you needed a group to go. That's why we're not all, they're not all weighing 800 pounds. I think your question is so the calves are there's more they bring more money in the spring there but there's a reason for that these there they will tend to be lighter than than a spring bred calf born calf because you know coming through uh, more forage easier easier climate on them so these calves will come through and be harder plus it's it's time for grass these guys want to give more for the for these this way to class this class to go to, to grass but when you get those heavier cattle the price on those kind of cattle that like these that are going to feed a lot, eight weights and all, that starts to hinge on where they're going to hit the board. And you'll see some of these eight weights now, they're kind of in, in just eh, iffy ground because they're targeted to hit some of those weaker markets in the summer. Now, you, when we get in the, into uh, middle of summer, into fall, then you start seeing this spike in prices as April board, April board, that's all you hear, April board. And you'll see as that goes forward, You'll see at some point, eight weights outsell seven weights, nine weights outsell eight weights as they approach that board. Boy, when it, when they go off the board, that weight class goes off the board, dollars cheaper. So, you know, again, that's something you need to uh, kind of uh, look for in marketing your cattle as to like, you know, these lighter cattle, they're in great shape. They're gonna get past that uh, summer board and they're going to go ahead and hit a better board. Now they're going to spend a lot of time in the feedlot at this at this weight, and they will probably come out at a lighter weight than the, these bigger cattle we've seen, because the hot ration they'll just they'll just do better on. That's what it's going to be. Uh, to, another thing about the spring break calves, as we go into fall and they get more of the weather change, we have more health issues in 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 calves going into the fall because the up and down weather, and they're carrying more flesh, they are just a softer calf. If you understand what I'm saying, they're just a softer calf than these coming through the winter. You just don't hear about as many health issues with fall bred calves weaning up I mean, as you do the spring bred calves. They just, they, it's a time of year, they will go out, the up and down temperatures hurts them, uh, the dust hurts them, uh, allergens, just like people, they get allergies too. So you'll have more health issues. In the business, we call October dead calf month. Right. Because those calves, when they hit October and they come in weaned, that weather, or you may have a 30 degree swing from daytime temperature to nighttime temperature. Boy, that's hard on them things that are going to ball around. So that's, uh, you, you, we just customarily will see good prices on these cattle through the summer till we get in about the second week of October, and then you start to lose traction and it is, it's kind of a struggle off and on. Sometimes a, a, an early frost, early cold weather will help harden those calves, it helps a little bit. But then you also get to the point where there's a lot of them coming. So it's supply and demand. Demand, you know, demand stays, but the supply is so big they get more picky. So you can start to see that price start to level off, taper off as you get into fall. Ordinarily, they would. Somebody at this at this weight, grass. they would go back and go up to 800 pounds. Yeah, somebody gonna put them on grass to probably ground eight. Is that? So I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you the reasoning here. When when you send cattle that are mostly home raised or some bought, and, and you when, when diesel fuel is four dollars or five dollars, you gotta fill the truck. Right. Okay. So these six weights are known to fill the truck, and there's not a lot of them. But I will also say. Charlotte are both heifers calves. Okay, yeah. the number one reason 
not to use a heifer bull on cows because this is what you get. You just get you just get smaller, lighter calves. Now, these will go out on the last group. Whether they're done or not, they're going to clean the pen out at some point. And, and they'll finish and they'll go. And we, I, you know, we'll see whether they're profitable or not at the end of the day. They're going to get priced off a of grass cattle price, which is fairly high right now. So yeah. profitability on those is probably as good as any of them. But, um, you know, just from the genetics, I can, you know, they're, they're the same age as the other ones, but I know two of them are just off of average calves. So you take that as a little bit of account. But they're selling the weight of the truck at this point, and they're steers. I've had these type of steers that go to go to the feedlot, and they'll gain five pounds a day, and they'll finish with the rest of them. Now, I'm not saying all of them do, but I'm saying some of them will. Being a steer, if these were six weight heifers, not. They're going back home. Hopefully, we took all those off. Yeah. We'll see here in a minute. But, hey, I left a few extra pounds. Being a steer, I'm willing to take the gamble that these things are probably going to catch up a little bit. And knowing the age of them, now, they're not going to number one rule of selling anything is you're selling by the pound. Right. And, and you talk about carcass weight. The most profitable calf that you can feed is a 1,049 pound carcass weight. And grade at least a short one. Yeah. Okay? So, you have a great prime. Well, at least short. It, it is better than great prime. That's, 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 that's a But there's not that, that's right, there's not that many. Genetic, you gotta have kind of genetic or you gotta have a lot of days on the feed to get about 160 days on a hot ration to get it done. And that's not cost efficient at seven dollar corn out of it. I mean these things are probably gonna go out on a seven hundred and fifty to eight hundred pound carcass if I had to guess right. you know, based off of what the last ones have done. Now that's you know they're just kind of medium frame cattle when everybody is not a large frame anybody dive all out here does, does it look large to you? They're young, but I'm giving some doubt. But they're still being hovered in and feeding, right? They got chances, in my opinion, they can go to 1,200 pounds when they're finished at 120 days on feed out. They have to go for a little growing. How long are you going to grow them out there for? Before they turn them over? They turn them over and then let them all go? These, these cattle will, will probably they have a warm up. Yeah. And they go through about three weeks and then they'll just start stepping them up from there. These cattle will be on feed 160 to okay, 65 so days. A lot of days. And they'll and they'll pull the first ones out. So once they get those big calves up, they're showing about 30 pounds a day, and then they just let them go. Right now they're eating 38 pounds. The ones that are out there now. Seven dollars corn. Cost them Woo. five dollars a day. Sure. You can keep going way over dollar. Let's get those Dollar eighty. So dollar eighty. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Muscling. Dog one, this he's just rimming a little low run, but he's got a thing. So I'm taking away full down on his condition. Black one's one, good black nose Charlie one, and he's he pushed me to him. I saw him like I do, like two point nine over the, the red one there, but he's staying to it. So I'm getting some benefit of doubt that he pulled him down condition wise, pulled look like he pulled up enough. They got an active bone on him for me, so I look at the bone too on cattle. They got bone down there like toothpicks. They can't be at very heavy muscle down with people. That's just the way it is. I was taught in school you judge an animal from the ground up. And if you're not sound, you don't want to keep it. And it's a female, so you can make And something you said earlier, of course, uh, uh, Zach addressed also. I mean, these are, are, are Kevin E's genetics behind these. Zach said a while ago, you know, he said something about heifer bulls on a cow. Didn't you say that? Yep. Okay. I said don't do it. Right. I'm saying that too. What I know some guys say it is the back, mm. they keep some heifers back and they want to breed them and they go to your friendly breeder and you want to have them. And you get them bred. But then they put the heifer bulls on the cow. That's the worst thing to do. For you guys that have come to the cow sales, you've heard this over and over from me. Heifer bulls on heifers, cow bulls on cows. We, we, uh, the rise of the Kevinese genetics has corresponded with the, the rising age of the cow calf man. So we don't like to pull calves. As we get older, we don't like to pull calves. Nobody does anytime. But when you take that too far, 
to where you know I, I can see a difference here in the last few years of, of you know some of these cats aren't as good as they used to be because of Cavanese genetics. Part of that is it's hard to find a good moderate birth weight bull anymore. The public has demanded Cavanese. The breeders are providing Cavanese. I mean, whenever I have a cow, everybody wants to know who's CED with it, plus 12, plus 11. That's not going to help you in your production of, of beef cattle going forward. So again, uh, I'll, this is what happens at the cow sell when I sell bulls. Heifer bulls on heifers, cow bulls on cows. Keep it that way. Don't get extreme either way. We went through that. I used to have a Charlotte 100 pound birth weights constantly. We just, it, it, we, it was a rule of thumb to pull calves. I don't like that. But I don't like those little bitty things out there either. These will be the heifers coming in now. Zach will tell you that he's had some carryover heifers on these is why these heifers are bigger. There's some heifers with a little more age and you can pick them out. Look, look by the switches on her tail. And I've got some guys that go to the sale barn and buy 550, 600 pound black heifers to grow them up, fatten them out, make them weigh 12 and a half, 13. And I, anybody, does anybody either feed cattle out their own, themselves? Well, they got a saying, all these packers got a saying, OTMs, over 30 months of age, and they will dock you. Some plants that dock you 10 to $15 in the carcass, and I got one plant that dock you $40, and that's quite a little bit on a 800 pound half a carcass, but they don't want them. So I've got this one guy helped buy cattle with, sits by me by the sale barn, and so I was looking at their heads, I said, look at that switch of that tail. If that, bed, if that tail is dragging the ground, you better not be betting on that heifer. But if you're too good a feeder, you're going to make about 1,300 pounds. You're going to have 10% of them going to be OTMs, and you're not going to like that dock. So you got to, you kind of have to look at them, you know, and know the cattle. He, he, he buys a lot of cattle, you know, whether you know it or not, you got guys out there that bids on them buys them, it's kind of a reputation. If they bought you cattle in the past and they've done good and they've had good turnout, they don't mind buying them again. But they have something bad, they may check you off on a fire note pad there and say, well, I don't want to buy that Mr. Smith cat. I bought them here two years ago and they didn't, I didn't like the way they turned out. But like I said, there are fewer producers and there are fewer buyers. And uh, to address uh, through the sale barn, I do have buyers that, so, well, when did so-and-so sell their calves? I want those. When did they sell their calves? I'm looking for those again. By the same token, like you said, if they had trouble with them, let me know when they come in. I don't want them. So it's important again. Quality, health program in them. You know, I've, I've, most complaints I've had is they might get sick on them. So make sure you get a good health program in them. Uh, now in these heifers here, some of these will be spring, they will be yearling heifers, and some of them will be. So I'll tell you the story on the heifers. So a lot of these heifers in this group right here, we'll be about 
lock man has to make moving forward. Do you tell them on the hook or do you grade the yield? Because if you sell them on the hook, it doesn't matter. You don't take the dock on the carcass weight. You don't take a dock on, on the hard bone. They, 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 they take that off. The early factor takes that off. And so <clears throat> we'll make that determination probably closer to August. What you're saying is the same thing as the cold cow. It's on the hook. So yeah, so what he was saying was when they bit a pen of cow, they just buy them off of the off, off well, live weight. Live weight's kind of average what they think that old pen's on. Whether it's 120 or 150 in that pen, they just buy them like bananas. They'll weigh them and shrink them 4%, and that's my pay weight when they leave. But I don't know how they do it. Now, I've been some of these older heifers out before. Well, this, this one plant that I send cattle to, and I've got two or three feeders that feed heifers, and 50 years ago, I was a pepper meat grade, and they hadn't changed it that much. And they all want cattle under 30 months of age, but cattle over 30 months of age, they can still grade choice. But the problem is, the Japanese don't want them. Telling you like it is. They can sell them in the United States, but they and they do, but they act like, well, we've got to take a discount and sell them. Well, that's a bunch of BS. That's just the way they talk to you anyway. They talk out one side of their mouth and they talk out the other side to somebody else. But uh, when they kill the cattle, and they, when nowadays they got veterinarians or layman inspectors right at the stomach shoots when they take the head off, they look at their teeth. They have two ways you can tell how old they are, their teeth or the chiron bone. And then when they come through the graders on the platform scale there and they're, they're split the carcasses, and on the end of it, there's a chiron bone. As animals grow young, they got white carcasses there. When the animals get older, you see ossification, starting a bone get there. I'm talking about like three or four years. Once you get, once you get to be six or seven, that bone is clear out to the end where it touches the chiron bone. And like a lot of these old broken mouth cows, that's just all flint in there, it's all bone. There's, no, there's not no cartilage in there at all. But that's the only way they can age it, like their teeth, and it's a, it's a judgment call. Like he said, he knows they're gonna be less than two years old, but that veterinarian inspector out there, he's God and you're not, let me tell you. What he calls it, that's the way it is. Muscling his steers. You all can see that. There's a black ball in here someplace. I think that's her right over there. It could be right here. You look behind on the round, like here's one right here. That's the number two muscle right there. That black one right there. Brown and black. He's right over there. And there's a black ball over there. There's a black ball there. Look at her butt back there. She's kind of thin, but she's light muscle. Two so, so we got three, probably, how many got in there? 15? 18. So 20%, you got to do a little math again, 20% is 18, 4, 
there's two there's four two there's what I would call them as coming as I call them sell the group. I put these down 18 heifers, mostly black, weighing eight thirteen, ones and twos. Flesh condition would be uh, uh, just medium, 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 medium plus some of them. And what I would bring. Eight weight heifers. I don't pay a lot of attention to heifer training. I'm a very people. I'm a spirit man myself, but I'd say yeah, and probably in the low thirties. flesh differently when they put flesh on and they're still you know, except there's a reason. Okay. She comes a lot. Yeah. 
know, some old timers in the cell bar, and they come in and they want to know if they've been and they say, yeah, they're done. I mean, they're not going to keep the cows, they're going to buy them to feed, but they won't bid on them if they've been and that's a the law. Uh, there are 15 of these, uh, like I said, slightly younger heifers, weigh 709, weigh 709. You see the, the, the same thing that uh, applies to the heifers as we went through with the steers. A little more compact body uh, score on them, a little de deeper body. Really a nice set of heifers to go to the feedlot. I mean, they'll make some beautiful heifers when they get the finish on them. And then again, you can see, and I'm not picking on the blacks, but the blacks are a little, look like they're a little small frame. They're not small for you know, We got three frame sizes, small, medium, and large. Well, these would be the middle of the road, medium frame heifers, or these black heifers. Your exotic heifers, well, the colored heifers, I gotta watch what I'm saying. The colored heifers tend to be, you know, large frame, but not all. There's a red, there's a redneck heifer here. There's this black nose, or kind of pinky nose one right here. But, but. And then again, I've heard guys say, uh, Take them white nose heifers off, and they do. And they they're going from an old fallacy that they say that them white nose heifers don't break joints. Well, I differ with that. I've, I've killed some uh, fair cattle steers. They want to have steers, black nose steers, and white nose steers. And the white nose steers just spread right along with the black nose steers. They're all ready choice. So they're just going from a fallacy. They heard somebody say in the coffee shop, don't buy no white nose cats because they won't break. <coughs> well, my theory is if you feed enough uh, seven dollar corn or anything, feed them enough days, they're all going to break choice. Well, part of that carryover comes from years ago, of course, the, the Charlet Simital, they were all larger frame. and didn't carry the, the bustling and meat that these new more modern type Charlet and Simital carry. Like I said, these kind of cattle here crossed up those dark noses and even the white noses. I sell them in here. If you got a straight Hereford, go home and kill your bull. If you got a straight Charlet, go home and shoot your bull. And I've got Charlet bulls, but I'm not going to kill mine. But uh, do as I say, not as I do. The reason, the reason that the, the Angus industry, the Angus cattle have, have, one of the reasons they have kind of taken over the countryside. Um, first of all, they are good cattle. They carcass excellently. I mean, they, they are good, good cattle. But the American Angus Association also pays some premiums and some programs on the retail side. And that enhanced the, the packers and all to, to start to buy more black cattle. The thing of it is though, well, as the old saying goes, when that hide comes off, it's pretty darn hard to tell just what the carcass is out there. So uh, right now we are, we are in, in, in black as king, no question about it. Uh, but don't, a lot of people don't, well, still don't want to raise black cattle. So make sure you have a color that that's, that is competitive in, in pricing when you go to sell them here so you're not mad at me because they're five, 10 below behind. But uh, along with that, projecting into the future, uh, the Angus industry, the Angus cattle also have to watch what we talked about earlier. They are the most dominant breed out there by far, but they also carry the most Having these genetics by far, so those cattle world are, I see it, they are starting to get smaller. And be very careful when you go to select your Angus bulls, look at their feed, look at other attributes around them because the Angus industry, all Angus breed, also carries the most genetic defects of anybody else out there. So they have concentrated their, they've got numbers out of this world, but they've concentrated their genetics pool so much. They're the things you just have to watch for. Don't give them up because of just what I said, but choose cow bulls for cows. Look at their feet. Look at, you know, if, if you have a pedigree, you know anything about it, why? Which I don't. Kind of look at, look back up and see, you know, that they have all kinds of information concerning uh, genetic defects and uh, everything, every attribute that's out there. But uh, we must, we don't need to lose sight. Of course, I grew up back in, the, uh, had a lot of cattle back in the 70s and 80s, and it was a rainbow make no difference what color there was. We had everything out there. So now all of a sudden we've got to where we have the technology and the ability to judge cattle better. And now it's it's what it's eye, eye appeal, eye contact on them instead of just what the carcasses will do. But again, good cattle are good cattle. So uh, just kind of, uh, you know, you know, everybody doesn't want to raise black cattle, but try to raise colored cattle 
that, that have these kind of look about, it, have the same kind of frame. Again, you know, this is part of this is an educational deal. Try to get the cattle that will go to the feedlot and perform and grade and yield at the top of the market, regardless of the color of it. If these cattle are here money, would you sell them all in a group like this, this group right here? No. You sort the blacks off? I sort the blacks off. There's kind of a white nose shard. That thing couldn't go on. Are you talking about taking that out for? I could probably sell the blacks all together and all the colors except for the white nose shark. But they will take her off. It's like you said, you know, there's, a, again, there is that extreme prejudice against, against uh, the white nose shars and the Herefords. I got a couple guys that feed four or five hundred heads. One guy is steers, one guy is heifers. And we go out and sort and depends on who you sort them all. And I'll just tell you, the color cattle with some blacks on them, we sort them and we send them to Cargill up north to Scott, Nebraska. They don't care as long as the great choice. And they kill a lot of red eggs cattle up there. And then the good blacks, I send them south to Ark City, Kansas. That's Creekstone. I don't know if you ever heard of Creekstone beef, but they trick them nothing but Angus. And then I send uh, most packers, when, you, when I talk to them about, like, you got a load, load cattle, and they say, well, how many of them crossbred? I told them it'd be 80% black hide and then 20% color. And then I gotta tell them about what I've ever gone away and, and uh, there won't be any outcome. And that's all they wanna hear. And then if I'm wrong, then they eat my bus out next week when the cow get there and say, well, you missed the drive then. I said, well, I didn't. You got your hand up over there, cowboy, you're waving your hand, okay. Mike, you said the brother and I working here. Why do blacks wanna go more? Well, like what Chuck said, the Angus, it's been around and in the 70s, they come up with certified Angus feed. You all heard that. You got grocery stores around there, IV and all the mother, they're all featured. Well, it's basically because of the programs. Yeah. It's, it's, it's simple as put. Like I said, they went to the retail side. They went to the other side. We'll give you incentives for killing black cattle. We will promote the black cattle. Not too long ago, uh, IV had Angus Reserve. Burger King had Angus burgers. They were trying to duplicate, I mean, yeah. take beef out, put Angus in. It worked. Yeah. It worked. Instead of the promotional side, like whatever the breed did, just okay, here, here our cattle are and they're better. They went to the guys that, that buy it and, and you know, gave them some incentives so they come back and then buy it. Certified Angus beef, there's a lot of cattle that make that that don't have a lot of Angus in that. So, but that, that's just what they've done. Uh, Anthony said, about time for my red Angus, uh, black Angus speech. Uh, like I said, the black Angus dominate the world. Red Angus, the only difference between what they carcass and the black Angus, there's no difference. The only difference is the pigment of their hair. They're the very same animal, but yet, when I go to sell red Angus cattle here on Mondays, they'll be to five, 10, 12 behind. Very same thing. But it's just because of the promotional value of that. Like I said though, things don't say the same. A pendulum can go one way and it can go the other way. Like I said earlier about the exotic cattle we had, we had everything came through here. Got over here to where the Kianini came, which you don't remember those. They're about as tall as this rail right here. They that was it. Then it started coming back this way, the other way. And then Angus got in and promoted their certified Angus beef, swung her back over here. So really, who knows where it's gonna go next. When I was growing up, my dad and grandfather was a trucker and trucked to East St. Louis. And had a lot of little producers, brand, uh, Angus producers, had, you know, 15, 20 cattle. Every now and then, one of them black cows would have a red calf. So they'd get, they'd get it up, and they wouldn't be out long by the highway. They'd take it to the back 40. I'm telling you the truth. I knew two, three of small producers. They didn't want you to know that they had a red gene in their black cows, but they did. But then somebody got smart and started buying on them red gene. Angus, and then somehow called Bingham, and I think that's how we got the red Angus cow to come around. But there used to be a lot of small Angus breeders, they didn't have the harder cow, they just had 15 or 20. And they go out and buy different bulls, and every now and then one of them bulls would throw a red gene. And they'd have, a, it'd be a black cow, and they'd have a red cat. Well, he's exactly right. You know, if you drive by somebody's herd now, black cattle, you just see strictly black cattle. When I was a little young, just like he said, these smaller herds, they were red ones in young. Um, you talked about the implants earlier, and that you were talking about the heifers and stuff. Well, we all know that we put implants up here. Yeah. And it was, the implant cost a dollar. And so why you don't put them in your heifers? 
I know, but why? You keep your heifer back to breed? Yeah. And you think it messed you up? Well, you need to go to the extension office and have them pull up that K-State research about 20, 25 years ago and see what that pamphlet said. Well, I don't want to contradict you, but I would like to, you know, make sure that one study, there's some other research that kind of balances that out because if you know, uh, whenever, whenever you go to the computer with something here, well, you'll, oh, you want to learn about this. Well, you come away more confused than when you started because everything's a contradiction. And so there you go. I do know that now through here, there are some natural programs, steers or efforts. Guys don't want to buy them with implants in them. They will not touch them. There's, they just want to go ahead and get the all natural programs in. So, so I'll say this a little bit on the jack. You've seen these white ones, you know, yeah. that, that have come through. Yeah. That's my experiment. I bought a Charlotte bull two years ago for the first time in probably 15 years. He, he was number one, one, top 1% one for marbling and top 1% for ribeye. Yeah. What kind of cows are out of Crawford cows? Yeah. But uh, here, I told the feedlot man, and there's some of them sitting out there now. I said, here's your, here's your thing. You're going to make those weigh 1,000 pounds on the carcass. Great choice. And there's my grand experiment. I'm going to know here in about another month or 45 days whether that's going to be good or not. Of course, I got another two calf crop hitting the ground that, uh, or in the cow. So I screwed up about five or six years of that uh, to see if that doesn't hold true. But no he was completely terminable. Why? About as wide as he was tall. He was not a large frame bull. Yeah. He was a large frame bull. But he had a lot of bridges on it, a lot of meat in it. <laughs> As I looked at my carcass data over the years, the one thing that I was lacking was carcass weight. If you, if you want to bring carcass weight up, you got to look for ribeye. Yeah. Okay. I mean that—that yeah. that is one of the biggest drivers on carcass weight is ribeye size. Can't lose my marble. I, I, most of my cattle have graded 95% choice and high. I have very few selects. You, you're doing something right. And, you're breeding. So, right. but I can't lose the marbles, and I needed the carcass weight. So there was my grand experiment. If you guys want to, when these cattle kill, we can have another meeting and, and, and I can go over how they did and uh, see whether these guys were right or wrong or not. Because right now, those dark nose targets in there will do anything that they, any black cow can grow in America. Right. Meat frame, muscle skin. Meat of the frame, most of them. Most of them are high, medium, large frame because they're half frame. What was it, seven something was they wearing? Seven oh nine. Seven oh nine. Muscle score, I, I didn't see but a couple of high twos in there. So most of them are ones. There's a black one over there and another black one. Black. I hate to say that, I hate to pick on some of these black bodies. That may be a true perfect Angus Cross, but it's been my experience, and I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes out there, the Herbert breeders. But the Herberts we have around here are not really heavy bone, not really heavy muscle. I graded some cattle in southern Missouri here a while back, and old boy brought in three steers for this feed out deal, and they had the heaviest muscle herpes I ever seen. And I told him, I said, why'd you make them steers? Well, they said, Herp they don't sell worth it. I might as well just cut them. I said, if you need to find somebody to sell your bulls to, because they're the heaviest muscle herpes males I've seen in Missouri. And he's just a little small producer. But he told me he got his cattle out of Nebraska. That probably makes a difference. Now, this gentleman right over here has Horton Herford cattle, and he had a production sale last fall, and sorry, Roger, but he does produce awfully good cattle. And I mean carcass value cattle. So I, I, I understand what he's saying. We Everybody wanted to run out west. You couldn't sell a local bull. Everybody went ran out west to get a Horn Herford bull. Well, they come back here, they're just like, I don't see a wire. What's the what's the, the cachet of going out there? Because, like he said, a lot of them are slender muscle. Now, the guys that have kind of stayed with it and worked with it, it's like the Charlet guys. They moderated their frame score, put more <coughs> muscle on the Herford. They put their frame score up, put more muscle on. Them. They've come a long way. So, uh, it's it's the ball is you know it's a, it's a good crop. Right, but everybody. They've got black body cattle. Black body cattle have been selling good ever since I've been going to sell them. But I'm just saying, 
you get to look and study at them. There's a lot of black white bait cattle out of Herford Bulls in Missouri. They're not heavy muscled as some others, but they still sell them because they're black boys. These, these right here, they may be out of your bull, Parker. I don't know, black or white bait. But you know, a true black bald you can see it. And then you got some that's out of a black semitone, and they're kind of a clay face bald. The true Herford, Herford Angus is the white them back to their neck. But these are, I didn't see but two kind of light muscles in there, and one of them's a black one, and the bald, and, and there's one baldy with a little lighter muscle than another one. I don't think that one there, he's kind of thin. It was one of the baldies, but I, I mean, I don't like to pick on, pick on, you know, cattle, but I, what I've noticed over the years is black baldy cattle sell to us, whether they're average or heavy muscle or not, or just cattle, just because they're black baldy. So if you just raise the cattle to raise cattle, you know, you don't want to raise the Charlotte Crosses with get a, get a black white face. They're sell good as anybody sell or you take them. But, but it's a package deal. One, two, three ain't gonna bring as much as 15 or 20 in a group. I just that's just a fact of life. Sorry. What are they worth? Seven hundred pound heifers. That's for sure, yeah, I do. I, I, I know, but that, if they weigh like 709, I'd tell you, Brent, you said 44, I'd say 49. So we're gonna put the difference 47. Record high for white milk stuff. Well, they're gonna help sell them. I mean, our lady gave them, our lady gave them by them, I'm one of the ones I'm around. Bill, man, I'll put that other our lady gave them by them. No, but he, he would buy. Like he, he, he likes his commission. That's why he buys. <laughs> Anybody got any questions? Let's go ahead and bend those cattle. You know, if anybody has any questions, though, I, you know, I'm sure that we haven't been. got something to say. Yeah. It's too bad. Go ahead. <coughs> so I want. Going back to the black and white debate, <clears throat> I'm going to say something a little controversial, and then I want your guys' opinion on it. If you if you look at the cattle market, the people that are buying feed and type cattle that are only feed lots, that you know most of those are corporate structures, right? Uh, anybody ever heard the term alternative marketing agreement? Okay. So most most of the world now is wrapped up in an alternative marketing agreement. They only trade about 10% of the cattle right now, cash cattle, and that sets the price for everything else. If you dive into an alternative marketing agreement, you'll find a lot of different things. You'll find that uh, the packer is reimbursing for the price of the cattle, the price of the feed, the care of those cattle. You'll also find things uh, that there are targets in there that. Uh, if they're buying 200,000 head of cattle a year, that they've got a great 80% choice, 90% choice, certain amount of CAD, certain amount of primes. You'll find a lot of that in an alternative marketing agreement. The black cattle, as a whole, this is a broad stroke, the black cattle tend to grade better as a whole than the continental cattle. These guys are playing the averages of the game. That's why. That's why you have buyers sitting in there that only want black cattle. It's not that the colored cattle are any worse. It's that they are wrapped up in an alternative, or they're buying for somebody that's wrapped up in an alternative marketing agreement that has to hit a certain amount of specs. Gentlemen, am I right or wrong? You're right. How do they, how do they measure that against the red Angus cattle, though? Because they'll do everything. They'll carcass with that.
you look at most of the bonus marketing for Green Group, there, there, there's, there's bonuses in there yeah. that you can't yeah. see, right. and there's discounts in there if you don't hit the target. So, and you see the discounts. And, and the only time you really see what's in those alternative marketing agreements is when Easter Day goes bankrupt and they screw tight yeah. up and they turn the paperwork over to the court system. I don't know if anybody of you followed that up. But this, this, there are larger things within the marketing sector that drive it that aren't necessarily related right. to price, right. economics, or even profitability right. at the end or of the day. Or just basic people right now. Right. How are we ever going to change that, Roger? How does that ever change? does it because here's the problem fat cattle drives the price of everything in the cattle market I, I mean it is a derivative everything is a derivative on the fat cattle and if you cannot move the price of fat cattle how are you ever other than killing well, cows how do you ever change that lesson well i want to say something anybody here listen to the feed of flash from my buddy corporate wall old Texas graduate, but he's pretty smart in my opinion. And he's kind of right. And two senators in, in uh, with other edits in, in Washington, D.C., they want to come up with this negotiated amendment we got to buy. Well, you got what I was told when I left the court, but I don't know. I don't belong to Texas Cattlemen. But the Texas Cattlemen Association, Kansas, somebody else, them guys, they're kind of cahoots with the, the agreement, so they don't think we need that, but seriously, do if, if you an auction is the best way to determine value of anything, especially in livestock. So if you present a group of livestock to some competitive bidders on that day, you're going to get the market for what they were. But these other deals that they want to do, like what he's saying, they have these alternative agreements. And if you fit within that spec, then they pad you a little bit. But they, they, he's saying it's 10, probably about 12% of the cattle that sold weekly established the market for the other 88% cattle to determine the price. And that's not, that's not enough. Years ago, 30 years ago, we were like 40% negotiated trade. So they skipped it right. We've only got four factors, major factors. Tyson. JBS, we bought out SWIFT, uh, National Beef, and Car Deal. And out of the four, two of them are foreign owned. You know, Tyson and Car Deal, United States owned. We've got some other kind of regional factors. Like I sent some cattle to a plant called Dress Beef in Omaha, or Omaha, Nebraska. They've been in business a long time. It's a, it's a, it's a owned by Jew, I mean, and, uh, you know, he's still, been, they've been doing over 50 years. I graded Easter back 50 years ago, and then uh, you got a few others like that, and then you got Nebraska beef. That's also there, too. But basically, we got four big factors. We've got plants in other parts. American Foods, they're, uh, they're up north in Michigan and Wisconsin. They bought 160 acres there other side of Winston, Missouri, and they're going to put on a plant to kill, uh, they primarily kill Osteens or beef cows up north, but they, they do kill some beef cattle up there. So it may be, I, I never could understand, I was born and raised in Missouri, why our senators, representatives, we couldn't have a beef plant in the state of Missouri. Why you got to feed all this diesel smoke, all the cows, Go north to Nebraska, Michigan, or Wisconsin, or they go south to Alabama, or they go clear to Texas to be killed. Why we can't have a cow killing plant or two in Missouri? We were number two in the nation for years. Why you got to feed all this diesel smoke to them and truck them out of it? Same way with fat cattle. They all back in the 70s they all went out around Dodge City and built these humongous plants out there. But I don't know why. Our senator representative, you just got to have a lot of water to turn a beef packing plant. So I always thought on the Missouri side, somewhere from Kansas City, St. Joe, would be a good spot to have a beef killing plant to kill 2,500 cattle a day. But uh, we, just, we can't get it done, huh? Is there a new uh, slaughterhouse being built in Wisconsin? They 
It's going to be built. And the project, it's going to take two years to build. American Food, they've got three other or four other plants up north. Right on I 70. They bought land just, if you're familiar with going that way, right before you get to the General Motors plant, right along there. They bought 160 acres. They're going to build this plant right on I 70. Yeah, that's good. I mean, they're killed. I mean, they don't have to get off. We don't have very many old teams around there. We don't have, I don't know, any dairies like we used to when I was a kid. Everybody had dairies. We don't. I mean, we've got a few, but, you know, but they kill them. Hey, these cow kill them plants are real profitable. This hamburger has been real profitable for them. So I'm gonna, I'll, I'll say a couple quick things to that point. There, there's, there's one operating kill plant for fed cattle in the state of Missouri right now in Pleasant Home. The, the same outfit that I actually feed these cattle with is the same guy that owns the one at, at Pleasant Home. They're, they're doing the Missouri prime beef, okay? I sold it too old to death. Ameri that's that's late right there. Yeah. That's Pleasant Home. Yeah, Ameri American Food Groups, <laughs> in that new plant that is gonna be constructed, uh, they're saying about 70% cow kill, 30% fed kill. So there are becoming more regional markets for fat cattle in the state of Missouri. Uh, I, I think we can feed more cattle in the state of Missouri. And, and so keep your eyes close to the ground. There's, there's a resolution going through uh, to, to increase the amount of cost share money available to people willing to put up under roof feeding facilities. I hope it passes through all the junk, I know by fall. Keep your ear close to the ground on that or, or keep in touch with me because I think we're reaching a real opportunity here. If you want to feed cattle, if you want to feed your own cattle in the state of Missouri, I think there is an opportunity to do that. And even buy the good cattle that somebody else is willing to sell to feed in the state of Missouri. So uh, I, I think that's something that a lot of, I don't know about a lot, but several producers should probably look at moving forward. I've got a customer in rural city to put up one of these new slope, modern slope. The old five, he got four pens. He puts 125 cattle to a pen. He's got a pen, 14 foot deep. I owe a lot of manure. It's on 168. And he takes that manure and nights it in, and he's ready to grow corn or beans. Right? And he told me that he. He evaluates that manure, you know, whatever, but I mean, when, when I fertilize corn, I just put more money on it. But, uh, and I've got about three customers that put up these hoop farms. I know y'all seen a hoop farm. And they hold, you know, depends how big they are, how wide, but 150. I got a, a father and son that's got two of them up around the trench. One holds 200, one holds 240. And they work fairly good. You you know, it's on concrete, you gotta push it out and stockpile the manure, but when it gets right, then you can put it on in your, for your corn or beans and help on the fertilizer. So it, it, it's coming. If y'all wanna feed your own cattle, so just go on up and sell them, you, know, you have an opportunity. Yes, ma'am. So Chuck, on a different note, can you tell us a little bit, a lot of us in here, I think are Well, the, as far as the weight class, it's kind of like I said earlier, you know, you might kind of want to see what's down the road and get a feel for what's happening at the auction at certain levels, just pay attention to that. But get in a good program and kind of stick with it. Uh, the health program, MFA health program, any kind of health program is good. Uh, one of the, the most important thing about the cattle coming through is a health program. More important even than weaning it. I mean, when guys come in, they, they, want, they want you to, they want us buy the your calves, wean 40, 50 days, two round of shots. Of course, the reason they want to buy those uh, 40, 50 days is they want you to take the risk on the health. And when you do that, you have to lose weight and then you have to put it back on. But right now, that's, that's, that's not very cost effective. But the one thing about it is health program. 
I'll go guy, I'll run cattle in here and guys will say, well, and I try to always announce what it is and they'll say, well, when were the shots given or how current, how many rounds? If they haven't had any, some cattle, a lot of cattle, unfortunately too many cattle come through without any, any shots, any good health program, buyers will take their buyer numbers and they will lay them down and they will start to look at these signs up here and not pay any attention to what's going on in the ring. So it is getting a good program. That MFA health drug track program, it's a pretty good deal. You get the paperwork with it, the, the white tag program. A lot of guys, uh, producers, who have earned their reputation will just do that all themselves and the guys will take it as honestly that they have done that. But, you know, like I said, you are producers, you are buyers, everybody keeps track. Uh, as far as, you know, what you all do with your account, you're taking it up to a good handy way for these guys to go ahead with. So it's just, you know, some guys, they sell them off a cow in five weight. Some wean them and take them to six or seven weights. It's just kind of what your groove is and, and what the buyers then can anticipate from that. And as far as cost effective, that, that's, that's like shifting sand. It just changes with the cost of grain, it changes with the marketing, changes with the weather. Just, you know, that's one of those deals where it's, you know, you just kind of get in your program and stay with it and go forward. I like to say uh, the MFA program, there's other programs out there too. There's, there's, uh, yeah, Prince got one and somebody else. Right? Burke's got one out. But I understand they're good programs, but they do that too. And you may be somebody in there to sell feed, but you can get them to, these calves, you get them too fleshy. You can sell a thin, medium fleshed calf to a lot of people. But like Chuck said, we've lost a lot of these old farmer feeders. They're the buy them back. The smart guys won't buy them. So you're just to be, you're wasting money to turn to a self fear and let them go. You need to hand feed them or let them feed them, and you can get by with putting maybe 100 pounds on your calves to go in. But I've got orders to buy, right now I've got two guys' orders to buy grass cattle, and their orders is lease wean 45 days or better, two rounds of shot, not two rounds of black leg, two rounds of shot, and not real flesh. And that's what says. This time of year, right? Whenever we talk about the MFL health track or some of these other ones, you know, what he says, MFA sells feed. Sometimes they want you, you know, you need you need to have this much feed and you need to have this, and, and that has gone the other way. It has put, you know, there have been times we've sold cattle right in the year that have been in a good program, too much flesh, they don't sell as good. Then then you're mad at me because I said do all this stuff, and they said, what well, what happened? Somebody's breeding cattle that just right off the cow coming behind them and sell them a lot higher. Well, it had to do with condition, quality, condition, health, quality, health program, and condition. Just, just abide by that. Get the quality cattle. Uh, get a superior health program, and be aware of the condition. You know, attend sales, go see what sales and all, and, and take it from there. Then. Sure. Most feedlots want around an 800 pound calf to put on feed. It, it kind of depends on seasonal. I mean, they'll they'll take a nine hundred pound. They'll take a you know just it, what the heavier they get, it, it kind of goes with the flesh it's going to take to to go ahead and finish. They don't want a nine hundred pound green steer. They want a nine hundred pound steer that's got some. He's been he, heated up a little bit, as we say, to go forward. But and he knows how to eat. But the, but that eight weight is is kind of a handy weight for for the ration they'll go in if they're in moderate flesh to go ahead and and, and finish at that that optimum weight carcass weight that they want. So that's traditionally these, you see these eight weight, mid eight weight steers, eight to nine, those guys, and some of the lightweights will go, but that's just kind of the best way to get them, the most efficient cost per gain to get them into the, to get them to fat cattle. Like I said, now he's got some light cattle, them guys are gonna eat a long time. Well, I figured out the average 757 if I did my math right. So that's that. If I did my math right on the ones he runs through, they were 757. Oh. So the heavier weights, of course, some of those heavier weights with their greener condition and that muscle score, those crossbreds are going to make some big carcasses. Probably those uh, that that 724 steers uh, on the ration they're going to go into, they 
they might be the most efficient, efficient going forward with them as far as hitting their carcass, desired carcass size and all. So the other thing about that is, of course, lower carcass weights, that's less meat to hit the market, so that's kind of a good thing, really. They'll move cattle faster, they'll move cattle through the process faster. I will not take issue with Roger said earlier about his old buddy at Court of Wall uh, proposing a uh, negotiated, so many percent being negotiated, it'll never happen, it'll never work. The, the, the system is too corrupt. If, if they, if, well, it's, it's too corrupt. If, if you go in and they say, okay, we're going to make 35% negotiated. Well, JBS, Cargill, they just go to their formula providers. You've heard of formula cattle. They say, well, okay, guess what? We're going to negotiate with you, wink, wink. Well, then they just screw the system. And then who's going to step in and, and oversee that? Okay, somebody, the government's going to have to stick somebody in there, another bureaucratic level, somebody's going to have to get in there and watch and make sure, okay, this is so many were negotiated, so many weren't. That's just another payoff, basically. I mean, we've seen, I know it's hard to believe, but there's corruption in the cattle business. And at that level, it's extreme corruption. The JBS guys, those uh, Batista brothers, I mean, you've heard about those guys, they bribed the president of, of Ar uh, Argentina. I mean, these guys play, the, the owners, the, the foreign owners, they play extreme hardball. So, you know, trying to go in and, well, we're going to make you do this, ain't going to happen. They're going to do what they're going to do. So it's something where you just about almost have to try to, well, there's always been corruption in the, in the packing industry. We are much more aware of it now because there are fewer producers, again, fewer, uh, fewer producers, fewer buyers. Much more information. Now we get that stuff instantly, so we know and we are, uh, oh, it just, you know, we're so mad about it until the market goes up. You don't hear so much about Packers cheating us now. The market's up, we're all sharing in the pie. They're still cheating us just like they always did. But now it's just, oh, well, okay. We're getting ours, so we don't care if they get theirs. One of these days, it'll go back the other way and we'll be right back where we, they're just cheating the crap out of us. They always have. Unfortunately, always will. They'll buy off the politicians at a high, high level. Crap, this is on Facebook. I probably won't be here <laughs> another month. Uh, I just put a bullseye a little, out. A little plant in Missouri, north of Springfield, at Pleasant Hope. They, uh, they're supposed to kill about 500 cattle a day. And I sent them two loads of beef cattle last year. And they was killing fed cattle on Friday, and they've been killing cows on the other three days. About 300 cows a day, and then they killed 300 fat cattle. They haven't got up to 500. But what I was told that they went around and they were trying to sell some of their meat to some of the Missouri stores, and I don't know which big packer, but they buy meat from them. But their salesman showed up and said, if you buy any more steaks from Missouri Pleasant, you know, we're not going to send you any more. I mean, I mean, it, but it's all, it wasn't on paper, it wasn't a recording, it's just his say, my say, but it had an effect on it, let me tell you. Well, this is what I've, what I've just been talking about here is kind of a repeat of a, a view from the block of King Charles, as uh, Luke said, uh, here a few months ago, and, uh, uh, like these new plants coming in. Now, I hope the very best for them. I hope that they are successful. They provide a great alternative to the plant system we have now. My fear is that these plants, first of all, they're gonna do everything they can to block them from getting up and going. They're gonna they're gonna block the construction. They're gonna work with the, the unions against them. They're gonna make materials higher. They're gonna block trying to get the things constructed. Secondly, then, if they do get it up and going, the thing gets out and it shows the profitability. Like I said, they don't come around 
We really like what you're doing here. We would like to buy your plant. First go around, those guys are gonna say, screw you. We built this for the American people, the American cattlemen, we're in business. Okay, come around about a year, another year later. Boy, we really like what you're doing with this plant. We would sure like to help out in this. We would like to participate in this. Sorry, we're doing just fine without you. Well, thing goes ahead and stays profitable third time around. Boy, we really like what you're doing here. So do we, but it's time for us to let you guys in. So uh, the concern is, again, if it's good, if it works out, those guys are huge. They keep track of that stuff. If the little plant in Missouri goes and has success, they will pay attention to that. They will have an effect on that. So, I mean, I don't want to be too pessimistic. It's just that's the world we live in. So the thing to do is do what you can within your uh, uh, range of, of work with cattle to try to make the most of it. The thing is, don't go, don't get to worry too much about what goes on up too high. That's too lofty of air. Just kind of worry what you can do at the farm, at the market, to meet the, the demand that's out there. You go start to worry about those guys. You'll lose sleep at night over nothing. Might as well just go ahead and, okay, what can I do here? They're going to do what they're going to do. Any other questions? Oh, no, they're too sad now. Wait, one more thing, though. But like I said, though, I really, seriously, that is on top. And that, that is something we've got to deal with. But don't let that deter you from doing what you're doing. Go out enthusiastically and produce the cattle you want to produce. Get up and enjoy your livelihood doing that. It is still a great livelihood. It's as good as it gets. So, you know, uh, in all levels of society, there is going to be some amount of corruption and all to deal with, and this is ours. But like I said, don't let that deter you. You go home tonight, get a good night's sleep, and go take care of those cattle tomorrow. How about that? So, so just if you want to follow along and, and look at the markets on these deals, Robert and I were just sitting here talking about what the break even is going to be on these types of cattle. Uh, and of course, a lot of that goes into cost of game. Okay, seven dollar and fifty cent corn does not help, obviously. Death loss does not help, but feed conversion is a big one. Okay, that 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 drives your cost of game. My cattle have generally converted very well, somewhere around five and a half pounds to the pound of game. Uh, that's dry matter feed to the pound of game, uh, and they they never gain less than about three eight three nine as a pen. So. Uh, if, if I kind of, yeah, make sure steers and heifers, and I do. They feed in the same pen, and and as long as as long as that does not change, and they can they can still feed uh, feed the drug with them, that'll keep them from coming in heat. Uh, that that is not a problem. Feed steers and heifers in the same pen. So uh, break even's probably going to be in the low 140s, just based off of historics and price of corn now and. Feed lot guys telling me is what he's projecting for a lot of cost of gains uh, moving forward. So uh, if you look, August is at 136. October's at 142. Say a big prayer. I need to get back to that 150. Is there anything else, y'all? Zach, how many years have you been sending cattle out west? I think this is about. Fourth year, yeah, at least. fourth year that I've been doing this. And your death loss, if you've done the proper health program, is it? So my death loss on home raised cattle has been very small, less than two percent. Uh, in some pens, in, on home raised deals, I've had a few lose none, which is fairly rare. Uh, buying cattle has been an experience, and that that has pushed it up some. On this last group, it's going to be five and a half percent. That's going to be a killer. But that's the ones at home, not the way I think of the yard. I mean, the ones that's in the yards yeah, now. That's the ones that are in the yard. Oh, well, they just took profit off of you this time. Yeah, I think they had a big party at some point and needed a butcher meat, is what I think. <laughs> now, they're, they're, yeah, they're on Facebook now. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Shot I'm, not, I'm not watching them every day, so it, it, it is not for the weak of heart. Uh, did you start them or did you just buy them then? So, so anything I have bought. On that last deal, I did not own them very long before they went. 
and that 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 was my mistake. They 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 were big cattle. They were good cattle. They didn't have my shot program in them, and I think that hurt me. I tried to get it in fast to them because I had some other cattle ready to go, and they just needed to go. Uh, that that was my mistake. You learned there's no such thing as a free education, right? So. Um, you now, know. did you ever go out there and check your pins before they continue going on so that you know you see your cattle in a certain pin? Let's say they took you your your load out there and they put them in pin 45. Are you allowed to go out there and see that pin 45? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I mean, and, and they'll, they'll welcome you at any point in time to come out there. They'll drive you around. They'll show you your cattle. They don't cut my farm tags out. I mean, they you know they, they may fall out, but they won't cut any farm tags out up until the very end. So they will retag them with their tags, but it's it's in another year. So uh, you can you can go out, you can look at them. I have before. A lot of times I just don't get the time. And that just that just is what it is. And we discussed this earlier, Zach and I today, that when he's going to send those out there, maybe he and I would go out and. And take a look at those this sometime this summer, which I, I have been out there. I'm sure looking forward to it. We'll probably get so drunk we'll never come back though after Sunday. So I'll let you know when we go out because that may be we've never come back. We'll be out there working the feedlot. We're working in jail. <laughs> What's that? That's right. We may be stranded out there. I said I wanted to ride the train out there, and he said, "No, that train's not a very good experience." David said, "David Clark, what do you think? The train's not a good experience." They did, David and I rode the train out one time. <laughs> now, what was the problem with that? Too many stops, no long ones. Too much alcohol intake. Well, after about three or four hours, of, <laughs> after three or four hours of touring a feedlot, we saw all we really needed to see then some, and so we became mechanics after that and worked on their tractors. Uh, that was the last time I went to that feedlot. Wrong, yeah, that was the best. Always go for a long day at work. <laughs> Turn around, get on the train, ride home. That, that was another one of those educations that was not free. At least last time we went there. So Leon, did you have a question? Yeah. When you run cattle through the help that you're there to represent? At the, at the auction level, you mean? Yeah. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. I encourage everybody. I don't care if you've got one to a thousand. I want you out here to, to give the story on them. It doesn't always work out that way. And it's getting less and less. It's, it marvels me. When I was a kid, we'd go take our couple pickup loads of cattle to the sale and we might sit there all day long and have to go home at midnight and milk cows and pick up the eggs. And now they just drive in, they'll leave a hundred head and drive off. I just don't get that. That's a pretty big chunk of cash there. But you should be there to watch how that goes, monitor it. Uh, you know, there's, there might be something, you know, there'll be a, a calf come through here that might walk off. Well, I don't know if it, if it got hurt here or if it's something at home. So I need questions answered. So yes, if you sell cattle, go to the auction and watch them sell. It helps. They want to, it's like I said earlier, fewer buyers, fewer sellers. If they can put a face to those cattle, that helps. That helps. And they do. Uh, it was like I said, you know, if, uh, uh, a good producer, they will. Somebody they're familiar with, they'll, you know, a lot of guys will do that themselves. And some of them have the white chain. I mean, which that saves you money, you're gonna have a vet do it. So, you know, the thing of it is, it's like I said earlier, build your reputation, don't take any shortcuts. I've had guys that, you know, like I said, they'll, they'll bring their cattle in, two rounds of shots, did everything right, and maybe have them out of condition, somebody else's cattle come in greener, they'll sell higher. Next time they come in, they've got one round of seven like It's suicide, Just get your program, stick with it. So Watch your condition. Oh, some, sometimes they do, but uh, sometimes they do, but nobody ever asks. I mean, I'll have that up there. And sometimes they'll bring that just as a list is okay, here's what they've had done rather than write it down. And that's, that's a good idea. I mean, you receipts from you know, your MFA or wherever you bought your uh, stuff, but you know, it's, it's uh, build your credibility. More so now than ever, because there are so few of us out there yet doing it. So get the kind of cattle, get a health program, we'll get your condition, we'll watch what the market is, watch, uh, you know, uh, this year through the winter and fall, I've seen less weaned cattle, reflection of the high price of, of grain. I've seen greener cattle come in, reflection of the high price of grain. People are adjusting to that, but 
know, the main thing is, is kind of keep the good cattle and, and do the right health program on them. So if you, if you look at large amounts of research data uh, and, and on a very aggressive implant strategy, it will reduce marbling by tenths of a percent. Um, but the economic data is when you, when you outweigh the decrease in marbling and the increase in carcass weight, it still very much pays to do it. So, you know, it's one of those things, unless your, your cattle are very borderline and have a high amount of selects, it, it, it's, it's still a no-brainer on an implant strategy. And, and so, you know, what these guys were talking about implants earlier, a lot of guys, you know, when they say they won't bid on them, and people think, well, they're going for a non-hormone treated market, right, NHTC. There is a pretty good premium in some spots for NHTC cattle. They, the person that buys those cattle cannot run them NHTC without the, the, the raiser, the owner, giving them that paperwork. That, that has to be certified at the ranch of origin. So don't assume, because it's a correct, it's an incorrect assumption that, you know, if they won't buy them because they're implanted, they're going for a hormone, non-hormone treated market because that's just not the case. They can't get them in there legally. They can't unless they're, unless they're corrupt and got somebody paid off, which, you know. So how many, So marketing calves or feeder cattle, yes. I, I would generally do one implant on them. Uh, sometime, and, and they'll say not before 90 days of age, right? So I'm one of those that says, if you're not keeping your cattle 60 to 100 days post weaning, a lot of times you're probably leaving some money on the table when you do that. I mean, if, if, you, can, if you can feed them low enough cost, a lot of times that will repay you. And so if you're gonna keep them over that 80 day period, which is kind of the minimum for an implant to actually work, okay? For you to get the full value out of it before the, before the, you know, the estrogen runs out. So if you're gonna keep them past weaning, at least, you know, close to that 80 day mark, I'd wait until closer to weaning to implant those cattle. But with implants, proceed with caution because I get a lot of a lot of guys will not bid on implanted cattle too. Why is that? I don't know. Are they paying Some of those guys are in those natural programs. He said something about you got to have the paperwork and all. Remember what I said earlier. It may surprise you, but the cattle industry has a good degree of corruption in it. So they don't have to, they can manufacture the paperwork if they so need it or buy somebody off to look the other way. So, so uh, all you are doing, all the guys that put better up this breeze program, maybe, or do I do farm visits or feed? Yeah. No, I mean, I would come to your farm if you. And you got some finished cattle to sell. Yeah. You know, gotta have gotta have certain spot loads, 38 to 42 head, depends on what you weigh. Talk about calves here. If it weighing 12 or weighing 1,400 pounds. Yeah. So I will say, if you mark it here in this barn, Chuck does farm business. Yeah. He likes to look at the cattle. I, I would I would encourage. Anybody that's selling cattle in a barn, he's, any tired, he's tired of me coming out there. Though. Well, <laughs> in, any barn to have the owner come out and look at it and gauge. Well, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I do a ton of farm visits and help with feed ration programs. Hell, nobody pays me. Yeah, we're all university. If you're feeding cattle, somebody's paying you pretty good. So don't don't go there. Right? I, there is, I don't come out for fee, is what I'm saying. I'm saying you're. But I'm not, I wouldn't come out to your farm if I feed it. Come out to the finish cat. They know I like Chuck. I'm not going to try to hurt him. Judge him. Yeah. Uh, if you would judge him, give me a grading idea on whether there's any breeding program changes I need to make. Okay, I mean, y'all kind of just kind of see what he did here. Now, I've been out your cat. Your cat great, all right. I mean, you're you're on the, on the right track. I mean, your cat. He's got he's got blacks. 
he's moving into a registered program. He's following his EPDs and, and doing a good job moving forward. Always had good cattle, but he's moving forward. And like I said, you know, we, as, as we go forward through the summer, we're going to try to have some more of these educational, informational programs. And we will probably try to have something later on where we'll, Zach will bring in some information from what kind of what's happened out there and, and you know, kind of share that with you so you can kind of put that, apply what's happening to what you saw here tonight, what you heard here tonight, then too. charge so so when you get a bill it'll be you know you'll have ration cost on it so whatever the ration cost is run at the time how many pounds the pen aid multiply you, you yeah. the tea, not the no I yeah I, it's strictly buying feed and so if they've treated any there'll be a charge for the treatment there'll be a charge for the hospital feed uh, when they implant them and they'll reboost them on vaccinations uh, there's a charge for that. Uh, they, they, there's there's plenty of charges, and so uh, you know there's two ways you can do it. You can if you got the money, the cash is deep in the pocket, you can pay it once a month. Feed bills come once a month. I let it dry. Interest rates have been cheap up until then, and so it really hasn't been that. And so what they do is they send me what's left over. I hope Roger some days there's even something left over. Right now they're going right now the feed cost is going to be about what the cattle are worth. I'll just, I'll do, I'll do the old joke. I don't have any money, but I'll send you some more cattle. Right. <laughs> Back in the thirties, you know, we're all, we're all, don't remember the thirties, but I remember my granddad was saying that, that if you take some livestock to East St. Louis, and they'd sell them, and they'd send them home back, say, well, your home's so good, but we didn't have enough to cover expenses, send us more money. And they'd say, well, I don't have any money, but I'll send you more damn all. But Ted, that's that's how I do it, and then they take it out of the black side. So have they pre bought the corn or do you can market price be free? So he he will he will market and he will pre buy corn. I mean when you know, when it makes sense to and I you know, I don't know where he's at right now. I mean he'll tell you when I visit with him, I just haven't really asked him lately how much corn he's got bought. And so you get charged that, but when you know, when that runs out or when the prices change, you see that on the bill. Um, the the disadvantage to where I see that's very southwestern Kansas, about 30 miles from Oklahoma, and about 20 from Colorado. Their basis on corn is a dollar over the board, over the board. Just because there's not that much corn out there, a lot of it comes in on rail. And so, you know, if, if you can, if board corn right now is 750, it's costing you 850 out there, generally, for the general rule of thumb. Part of that comes in, most of their corn comes straight off the farm, as much as they possibly can, rather than going to elevated sites. So they don't have the constant problem of blended corn, grain volume. That's 
How many of you want to do a program when it's all over with and see how this deal turned out? I know Shark had what you said your experiment was on. Yeah. They're in that whole pen and they're going to be on that whole truck. Are they? Are you going to get individual information on those? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I get completely individual data back on. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, it, and they don't charge me for that. Some places charge, those don't. Is that if you only sell human grade or will you get it whether you sell by the pound? No, that's only if you got to sell grade and yield and get the data. That's the only way to do it. I mean, that, if you sell them live, it's just, they're gone. So that that, that grain that grain yield deal can yield some pretty good premiums at times, and it can yield some very steep discounts because those hard bones are 300 bucks a head right off the top. So that comes pretty hard and fast. So when we, when when do you think you'll see an actual premium in this pen right here for source and age verified? I don't foresee that any time in the future. I do not see a source and age premium coming back. I really don't. They, the, and, the, and the reason that went on is because foreign countries had, had tightened down the age. They wanted them 24 months or less. When they relaxed that to 30, source and age pretty well went away. Because, I mean, that, 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 that takes in 90 plus percent of your fed cattle trade anyway maybe 99 percent so it never was an issue after that but the source and age was only to satisfy the, the japanese market pacific rim market when they when they tighten that down to 24 months or 20 months in some cases so does bqa make a difference bqa right now makes no difference <laughs> any sort of price. Now I would encourage anybody to go through a BQA um, just just based on the fact that it, 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 it's a confidence thing for the people that are buying your cattle at the end of the day. I think B, when they when they do BQA for, for uh, slaughter cattle or pound cows, that's coming. I don't know when, someday, maybe 10 years down the road. I don't know when. They will require BQA for pound cows and that's when it will all roll in. And everybody will need to get the equation certified. As long as it's the buyer, whether it's McDonald's or Wendy's or whoever, as long as the feed yard is there, of course, it's just more people they have to do it. Yeah, it, it, and so you, you will see a lot of plants. I think the plant, most of the, the two plants that most of these cattle kill at require BQA certification, but they require it at the feedlot level. So me as the producer, even though I own the cattle completely through, I, I don't, I mean, I am, but I don't have to be, I don't have to show any BQA certification. And then, but the feedlot does. Maybe, maybe so they, they're requiring it on fed cattle, but it's at the feedlot level, because that's the last hand they run through. What's that, what's that process look like? Like, I know in college, we went through BQA certification, but nobody ever picks that up every so often, or is it a one-time thing? So I think BQA is every three, What's that? Is, can you do that online now, or what's that look like? You can do it online. A lot of times it's free online. Um, you know, we used to do some of those certifications, producer meetings, you know, that there's not there's not a lot of demand for that at the moment. So, yes, sir. I'm gonna take uh, that online, and it's very simple to do. It's just, it's, it's very thorough, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a lot, lot of people do the online, and, it, and it, it, it's not a bad, I mean, as long as you're willing to sit through it, and, and, you know, you'll, you'll learn something. Okay, well, hey, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I'm going to stick around here. My truck doesn't show up for another 30 minutes or so, so uh, if you want to holler at me, Chuck's going to have me load. Hope you found it was worthwhile. I'm going to boss and tell them how to listen to it. But thank you, you truly. Thank you guys for coming out. Like I said, you know, it's, uh, it's part of the ongoing deal here. This isn't just a, 
merchandise and house. We're trying to help, help y'all out, David. So thanks. We'll, we'll have some more of these things as we go through the summer, everybody.